prepared. Our Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Thursday's edition of our webcast. Uh, thank you for joining us today on sustainability considerations in pension investment. My name is Hank Kim, and I'm the executive director of NC PERS. Today's program is part of our expanded center for online learning. As we all adjust to the new COVID reality, please bear with us if there should be any technical issues or unplanned background noise during our session. As always, your patience and understanding is appreciated. We encourage audience participation. Please submit questions by using the GoToWebinar portal. However, to ensure that we can cover all our topics, we will hold your questions till the last part of the program. Additionally, in the handout section, you will find a PDF of today's presentation. Today's webcast is sponsored by Legal and General Investment Management America, LGIMA, parent Legal General Investment Management, is a London headquartered trillion dollar asset manager. LGIMA helps institutional clients achieve their long-term financial goals through custom solutions. Their strategies range from market-based alpha-oriented strategies to those that are designed to be more liability-centric, derivative outlays, or indexed solutions. LGIM a team of experienced, innovative professionals are committed to helping plan sponsors meet their pension promises, manage investment exposures efficiently to deliver enhanced returns while mitigating risks and working to generate returns while making a positive societal difference. As part of, of a, a global enterprise, LGIMA uses their scale to strategically advocate for better governance help reduce long-term risk. They frequently engage in companies directly to promote corporate governance improvements and work with a host of capital market stakeholders to address areas that threaten market resiliency. Additionally, in April 2019, they launched the Future World Fund, a suite of ESG-oriented strategies. Overall, Legal and General has been recognized as an industry leader in ESG as a result of their proxy votes on climate change, political lobbying, and executive pay. John Hepner joined LGM, LGIMA in 2008 as head of, excuse me, 2018 as head of U.S. Stewardship and Sustainable Investment. He is the U.S. representative of the corporate governance team. John is charged with shaping the firm's corporate engagement and driving demand for sustainable investment strategies in the U.S. market. Michael Eisenberg is senior investment officer on the corporate governance team in the New York State Common Retirement Fund. The corporate governance team focuses on investment stewardship with issuers as well as integrating ESG best practices across the fund and its external asset managers in both public and private markets. John, Michael, welcome. I'll turn the pro webcast over to you now. Great, uh, thank you so much, Hank, uh, and thanks, Michael, for joining me. Um, I'm delighted to participate on today's webinar. Appreciate everyone taking time out of their busy schedule to join. Um, the way we constructed this is we want this to be viewed as a practitioner's point of view on sustainable investing. What we build, our approaches, some obstacles and learnings um, over the past few years, where we're headed. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna uh, share a few slides to set some context, and then Michael and I will have a candid exchange um, uh, of our own questions, and then follow it up with any questions you have. Um, please advance to the next slide. Or maybe I control that, next slide. Great, so uh, let's frame it up. Why is ESG pop up everywhere? Why are we on this webinar today? Uh, why is ESG a topic of almost every traditional investment um, conference? And the answer is uh, there are multiple drivers that are all converging together to, to reinforce popularity of ESG. Um, on one side, it's literally people in the streets, public pressure. Uh, we put these slides together at the end of last year. There were 6 million people protesting globally across the globe um, on climate. Um, and now if I were to put this slide together yesterday, 
you know, we, I was just looking at Black Lives Matter protesting charts. There's 4,000 cities where Black Lives Matter protests are happening right now. Um, so public pressure is clearly mounting. And the question for investors is how much of that public pressure is going to be translated into pressure on corporations and to their underlying investments. Um, so that's one driver, right? People in the streets. Um, another fact on the people in the streets that I just love is I was on an investor call with uh, uh, Google uh, last month. And Google has said that uh, searches for sustainable living have grown 4,000% over the last three months. So you have this COVID pandemic and everyone is rushing to figure out how do they actually bake sustainability into their everyday decision making. On the policy front, uh, on a global basis, you see regulators driving corporate transparency on ESG. You see regulators starting to define, regula uh, define taxonomies to, around what is green or not. Um, in the US, you may see some backtracking, and we'll talk to, about that a little bit around the DOL's recent uh, um, comments, but broadly, regulation is starting to drive uh, broad ESG as well. Um, another uh, force that's really important to know is that the underlying data, what is ESG, and I, I view it as the, the broad expanse of information that are non-traditional um, pieces of data, is growing incredibly quickly. So the quality of the data is expanding, uh, the, the quality of data is improving, the data coverage is expanding, and most importantly, the use is improving. So um, you know, here we have listed 7 million data points on Bloomberg. What, what, one of the most fascinating um, data points to watch is uh, that Bloomberg actually tracks loosely, they don't share it uh, to the broad public, is how much, how often these data are actually being used. And you see this, you know, as you can imagine, quite dramatic shift of it being used very passively to it's actually becoming built into people's models, etc. And the last piece is that there are actual assets flowing towards, um, towards ESG strategies. Um, you see a lot of, uh, I think it's uh, the latest numbers, 3,000 public or uh, 3,000 signatories roughly that have joined the United Nations Principles of Responsible Investing. You see lots of statistics that flows are going into ESG, um, ESG branded front funds. Um, and, and this is all creating this why ESG is popping up everywhere. And lastly, the most important point that overarches all of this is that ESG right now is moving from a history based in ethics to a future based in financial performance. That transition makes it relevant to everyone. And where you are, or what, where an individual asset manager or a pension fund is on that journey of viewing it as ethics or part of financial performance dictates how well you think it's integrated into your, your current plans. Let's advance the next slide. So I wanted to put a little, um, because NCPERS um, members and constituencies are largely public funds in the US, um, I wanted to kind of put some numbers out there to give a sense of who's actually pursuing ESG strategies. And one of the answers to question is to look at who has, and public plans tend to be fairly transparent. Um, so their public website, you can search a lot of information of how the, how the plans are structured and their underlying investment objectives, et cetera. Um, so last year we did some desk research and asked ourselves the question of the largest 100 US public funds, who has an ESG policy? And um, just as a, as, a, as a point of, as, a, as, a, as an anchor for us understanding who's doing what, you know, with the thesis being that you probably have a policy before you're going to take subst substantial action. And so roughly 37 of the largest 100 U.S. public funds have a, have a, a standalone ESG, or have an ESG policy, not necessarily a standalone policy that we could easily identify. Um, that alone is a really, really interesting finding because it says that the market's quite split. Um, interestingly, I would flag, and, and perhaps controversially, and this pains me to say, but the, the, the breakdown of who has ESG policies and who doesn't tends to follow red state, blue state lines. Not perfectly, but that is definitely one element of it. And that's, that's obviously very disappointing because it doesn't have to be that way. Um, we took it one step further and looked at with, uh, within those 37 plans that have ESG policies, could we identify if their underlying assets are actually intentionally targeted or, or um, built into ESG funds in one way or another? And about 22 of those 37 had, um, had assets allocated 
intentionally towards sustainability objectives or, or let's say with ESG mandates or characteristics. Um, slightly different, but you know, definitely where the legacy was um, is uh, some of those plans have specific exclusion policies and some don't. Um, so we also take, took a look to see what, how many of the plans had explicit negative exclusions um, again, many of these may come out of more of an ethics perspective or just a, you know, market standard. Uh, and again, about, let's say, 38 had some sort of negative exclusion. So let's advance to the next slide. So I wanted to uh, share a framework that I use um, all the time when thinking about ESG at legal in general. Uh, this is a framework we use to have uh, really structured conversations with prospects or internally about what is ESG. I don't know if you've experienced the frustration where two people are discussing some topic related to ESG analysis and they feel like they're talking past each other. And what I've realized is that it's because there's these many different dimensions of how ESG works and actually how it ends up in, into implementing or, or how it ends up getting expressed. Um, so I've, I view there are three interlocking pillars. The first concept is integration. And the purpose of integration is to improve risk return characteristics of any investment decision. This often involves taking new data. This decision is often embedded with the existing portfolio managers or existing investment research process. And it's a, it's a long-term journey that people are always gonna be refining and improving and just in the pursuit of improved risk return. That's one style of ESG that I like to call integration. The next pillar, is related to stewardship, has a slightly different objective. The objective is to, ch to use market influence to change, uh, to change the market, to change company behavior uh, over the long term. It doesn't necessarily, um, it, it's obviously trying to change it for some better purpose, but it's, it's, it isn't necessarily an individual company that you're trying to change. You're trying to use influence to, to, to shift and make markets essentially more resilient. The last type of ESG characterization is solutions. And these are actual funds, investable strategies. This is, I wanna design an, um, a low carbon global equity fund. Um, you know, what, what can you offer me? And you bundle it in a you know, collective fund or you put it in a separately managed account. And so there's a whole range of specific investment strategies or overlays uh, or analytics. And that's actually those those obviously have huge commercial interests for the investment consult for the investment managers, and that's what actually buy intentionally designed ESG exposure as a pension fund. So with that backdrop and those uh, that that context, I want to uh, open it up into a conversation uh, between Michael and I. Um, you know, as mentioned, Michael works for. New York State Common Retirement Fund, definitely one of the leading uh, thinkers in, in sustainable investments. Um, and so uh, let's dive right into the first question. And, and maybe before we, we dive right in, Michael, if you could give the, the group just a, a, a brief uh, set of contacts of where you sit organizationally so they have a sense of where your comments come from, and then I, I'll dive into the first question. Sure, thanks, John. So at New York Common, our corporate governance team focuses predominantly on two aspects. The first is our stewardship program, which as John mentioned, focuses on our engagement with our um, publicly traded issuers. Um, the second component of our program focuses on ESG integration. And so that piece, which we can talk about more in a minute, uh, focuses on integrating ESG into our own investment process, um, engaging with our managers, with our consultants, um, in order to you know have ESG considerations be part of our, our regular day-to-day -day work. So so I sit on that team. Uh, we are a team of eight. Um, and the majority of my time is focused on the integration side. Um, but you know all of us uh, will oftentimes uh, have roles on on both in one respect or another. So that's kind of how the team is structured, John, if that answers that question. Great. So let's just start with the big question, which is why? Why does New York State Common Retirement Fund explicitly integrate sustainability uh, into their investment program? Yeah, sure. So that is that is the question or the big question. So at New York Common, 
you know, we fundamentally believe that considering ESG factors contributes to the complete and integrated management of the full scope of investment risk. So uh, the fund doesn't see ESG risks as distinct non-financial factors, but as non-traditional sources of financial risk. So we always push back a bit on people who say that ESG factors are, are non-financial risk because you know, we don't fundamentally believe that. Um, we fully integrate those material ESG factors into our analysis of investment risk and manager performance, as well as our active ownership and monitoring program, the stewardship program to improve the, ultimately the risk profiles of our investments. So this involves encouraging our external asset managers, investment consultants, uh, and portfolio companies to adopt and employ resilient business models and ESG best practices more broadly to try to achieve more sustainable long-term financial performance. And, and because we believe that ESG risks are fundamentally financial in nature um, and can have a positive impact on the value of our investments over time, uh, as a universal owner with over 200 billion in assets, our ESG risk exposure, as you might imagine, is, is broad and, and highly complex. So uh, we obviously spent a lot of time on this. Um, so that's why we work with our public equity holdings via the stewardship program and our asset managers as part of the ESG integration program to really try to move the needle and incorporate ESG factors across the board. Um, we're fortunate, like I said earlier, to have a team of eight on our corporate governance team who work on those two programs um, and really allows us to have a significant amount of bandwidth compared to, to some of our peers. Um, we can really dig in uh, in every deal, support our investment officers with tools and deliverables, uh, both within the deal and outside of, uh, you know, the allocation context and, and work with our managers over time, as well as the our public equity holdings. So, um, you know, when it comes to the, you know, people who use the, the risk and opportunity sides um, of, of the of the ESG coin oftentimes for on the opportunity side for us, we have a $20 billion commitment that our sole trustee uh, controller DiNapoli has made to um, sustainable investments and climate solutions. So we have a dedicated, um, you know, on a separate team, a dedicated senior team member who's, um, who's fully dedicated to sourcing and shepherding um, investments that, that meet our, uh, you know, our criteria. Um, and supports our asset class teams to hit that that $20 billion goal. So we're fully committed to moving the needle over time on ESG integration, sustainable investing, and continue to try to push the envelope to get better and, and continually mature our program. So so that's the why, John, to your, to your question. I, I'd be curious, A, if you'd have any response to that um, and how, how LGM answers that, that why question. Sure, uh, thanks. The, the why is very um, similar to this the diagram that's on the slide still. So the across all of our active strategies, the why is improved risk return characteristics. So it's it's simply trying to create alpha. The why for the stewardship front is that we think we can actually improve beta ultimately, right? So we think that high quality stewardship we have a team of 15 people globally that think about proxy voting that think about company engagement that work with regulators trying to push regulators on improved transparency we actually think that improves beta ultimately uh, and then the last why is on the solutions front um, and you know of course uh, we see tremendous client demand uh, for new innovative products and so why is that we we are really we want to provide um, responsive products to our clients and, and also products that we think will be uh, with the products themselves will be sustainable over the long period. Got it. That makes sense. And, you know, clearly a thoughtful answer. So, I mean, maybe piggybacking off of that, how has, how has the LGM's offering an approach developed over time and, and what are the ranges of sustainability tools and solutions that you're bringing to clients and how you differentiate or delineate between each approach? Yep. So um, the, you know, as mentioned, the ESG integration is integrated into all active strategies. So it's it's baked in. The stewardship value proposition is 
overarching our entire brand of legal in general. So again, it is baked in and not differentiated by strategy. Um, on the solutions front, that's where you're really picking in where a client or where we as investment manager are delineating different types of ESG propositions and depending on client interest. So on one side, uh, so we have a, a suite of ESG intentionally designed funds uh, on a global basis from exclusion type funds um, to what we call broad ESG investment type funds using different types of tilting methodologies or um, uh, upping certain requirements for fundamental ESG performance um, or thematic funds where you're targeting a particular you know, climate theme or diversity theme um, all the way through to impact funds. And, and the, the, these kind of categories from exclusion to broad-based ESG to thematic to impact will range across the, the types of solutions we offer on a global basis, of course, there's different funds available in different countries uh, and different asset classes, but there's a huge matrix and, and that's how we structurally think about it. Um, what we've noticed in our own product development is the, the interest in standalone ESG solutions has grown over the years. Um, I'll give two specific examples which were, were notable in the market. Um, in 2017, in January 2017, we launched a default 401k plan uh, uh, fund for HSBC's um, pensioners in the UK. This was called the Future World um, Global Equity Index Fund, and it combined uh, uh, fundamental factors, so factor-based investing, low-cost quantitative model with ESG factors to use using a best-in-class index tilt where you'd have largely low tracking error and a low cost quant fund, but that had the safety and the diversification that you'd need and expect in, in, a, in, a, in a 401k type plan in the UK. Um, that's, that was you know, a multi-billion dollar uh, fund launch um, and has seen, seen success. Here in the US, um, as Hank mentioned right up front, uh, we launched last year a, a future world climate tilted fund where the, and again, this was for the 401k market, um, a corporate pension fund, um, where the particular objective of the client was to have very limited uh, tracking error deviation from a standard market cap benchmark. So um, let's say roughly under 50 basis points of tracking error um, from, a, from a market cap index, but with measurable climate improvements. We called that the Future World Climate Change Fund. It had three underlying components, um, which we used in a tilting methodology, carbon emissions, fossil fuel reserves, and green revenues to uh, increase the exposure to the companies that had good characteristics and decrease the exposure that had companies that had poor characteristics. Um, just one of many examples of, of how we're kind of listening to what are the objectives of a client and then producing funds that kind of fit that or different solutions. Um, but I'd say, you know, if you're to broadly characterize the evolution, the evolution has been, um, we think we have the best idea of what a client wants to really moving to this, what we call kind of a true solutions orientation and trying to understand exactly how the client's thinking about this question. Okay, you see climate risk, over what period of time do you see that climate risk playing out? How aggressive do you wanna be in reducing your exposure to industries that have high 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 exposure to, to carbon risk. And so we can tailor specific solutions. So that's definitely where the conversation is going. I'll pause there. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll flip it back to you now. Um, could you give me a sense of the types of strategies, you know, the specific strategies uh, that New York is using? Sure. Um, so as I said earlier, we look at ESG integration beyond what we might do in our global equities asset class. So while we do invest in products that have tilts and exclusions and other types of sustainable investing solutions as part of our sustainable investing and climate solutions program, we do look beyond that as well. So um, we have a robust proxy voting and issuer engagement program that files shareholder proposals and 
you know, works collaboratively with other investors like LGM through initiatives such as Climate Action 100 Plus to advocate for ESG best practices at our publicly traded holdings. Um, but at the same time, when we think about our broader investment approach, uh, we believe ESG needs to be fully integrated into every allocation decision that we make. So uh, most of the commitments we make do not have a sp specific sustainable investing mandate. So it could be an emerging market equity strategy, an Asian private equity diversified buyout fund, a European industrial real estate strategy, and North American distressed private credit fund, you know, you can, the list goes on, many others. So where we have been spending a great deal of time more recently over the last few years and have tripled our internal capacity in the last year or so is to focus even more robustly on integrating ESG into every allocation decision we make and engaging much earlier in the due diligence process, and incorporating ESG into ongoing performance monitoring of our, of our external asset managers. So. That means joining more diligence meetings, providing robust inputs on every deal, developing tools down to the strategy level for our investment officers, crafting action plans for our external managers, and, and providing that feedback and having that dialogue over time. And you know, it, it also extends to improving the uh, the kinds of advice we get from our external consultants as well. So we really do try to hit the you know the full sweep of of um, you know external actors that we work with uh, as part of our and our full integration program how Sorry, um no great 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 response how um how diverse are the sets when you're really pressing a manager on in a due diligence you know it's an early get to know them you've sent them the manager due diligence how diverse are the sets of answers to when you're asking some probing questions around where ESG fits in their investment process? Like, give us a sense of how how different are the answers out there in the market right now? Very different. I mean, we you know we ask those kinds of questions of of asset managers all over the world. So, um, and and because of of you know the the size of our fund, it, it's a it's a broad list of, of managers. So. We see all different kinds of answers, not just, it, it could be a different approach, it could be a different level of maturity, um, you know, they're, they're the whole range um, and, and, and at the level of, of maturity and thought, you know, kind of over time across the investment life cycle can, can vary broadly. Um, and we don't put lines in the sand that it needs to be one way or another necessarily, we just look for, um, you know, thoughtfulness and, and, and a, you know, a well thought out approach is, is what we're looking for. So, um, so the answer to your question, John, is, is very broad and, and very diverse as, as you might imagine. Um, so. And one other follow-up is you mentioned using your investment consultant, but also having your own proprietary approach. Um, you know, how yes. do you, how, how has that gone? How has that gone? Like, do you see certain times when the investment consultant is has a really different approach to how you're thinking about it, and or certain places where you you have to have your own your own? Just curious how how you guys have decided to split that uh, kind of division of labor. Sure, I mean that's a that's a terribly complex question, uh, even though it might <laughs> yes. seem straightforward. Um, so so our consultants are our partners, and and, and we view the the relationship that way. Um, you know they're providing a full suite of of analysis for us, um, and and we are always greatly appreciative of that. Um, but we do try. You know we have our own internal views, right? And while we provide certain amounts of, of guidance to them over time in terms of what we are looking for and, and what we evaluate, um, it's an important data point for us. You know from an ESG point of view, but it's it's just one data point and. That you know, building out the that internal capacity that I just mentioned, um, you know, is is to really develop and and work through and and be a part of the consideration process for a particular investment, so that we have the bandwidth and the capability to provide you know our own assessment of of what the manager is is putting forward. So, um, so the it's reason I we spend a lot of time on no, I, working with our consultants on that. No, I know it's complex, and but the reason that I I press there, and you know, for for the folks on the phone that are part of um, different pension funds, one observation that I've uh, seen 
is investment consultants are also at different levels of sophistication and have different approaches related to ESG analysis of managers. Um, there was a fascinating uh, series that uh, Funfire did at, uh, last year. I think it featured maybe eight or nine of the largest U.S. Um, consultants and asked them candidly, how do they approach ESG analysis of managers and kind of what is the process? And the process was very different across those seven. And what I've noticed um, as I've talked to directly to, to public pension funds is the level of service that public pension funds are receiving related to ESG analysis also varies. And so while these resources are, are you know, many of the investment consultants either have specialty groups or, or different, their, their own internal in, uh, integration is different. But, you know, my recommendation definitely to everyone on the phone who's, who's part is to, you know, push your investment consultant to help you to be a partner. Cause I don't, I really do think that people don't use them enough. You know, sometimes the own internal ESG investment consultant hasn't connected with every field consultant covering you guys. Um, so that's something that we always, we always say is that use, use them cause they, they tend to be pretty sophisticated on this. Um, let's uh, let's shift a little bit and, and get specific on the investment process. Um, so uh, could you walk through, Michael, um, you know, where in, in particular around the kind of investment process, uh, where does ESG show up um, um, for New York? Sure. So, you know, there are a number of elements to this. So first and foremost, in in both areas of the program that I mentioned, both stewardship and integration, um, we do a lot of our own research and analysis. So when it comes to the stewardship program, our team is analyzing proxies, um, filing and working on votes on shareholder proposals, looking at company disclosures, engaging outside of proxy season on, on key thematic issues that we're focused on, such as climate and, and diversity, mm -hmm. um, and focusing on driving strong stewardship, out stewardship outcomes uh, year over year. So external third-party data is a part of that. I know that's a you know third-party ESG data is a frequent uh, topic of discussion. Um, you know, we do subscribe to services, but it's just one data point for us, and, and we put a heavy premium on our own internal uh, research and analysis. And when it comes to integrating ESG into our investment process, um, we take a matrixed approach to how we go about that. So we look first at the manager's own investment process and how ESG is integrated throughout the investment life cycle. So getting those diverse answers that we talked about a minute ago. Um, and as part of that, we're evaluating a number of factors that are highly dependent on the manager and strategy uh, that we're looking at. And our analysis is tailored uh, to the strategy and asset class. Um, and it always begins you know, with that premise. So then at a high level, we're looking at things like tone from the top on ESG, we're looking at ESG policies and procedures, a manager's ESG due diligence process and, and how they're weighing uh, ESG factors, how ESG is incorporated at an investment committee, how ESG KPIs are monitored and improved upon and that will be highly dependent on the asset class and strategy, um, and how managers report that to us as their clients. So those are kind of the you know, six really high level elements that we look at it, you know, as a first, you know, in the first instance. And then beyond those high level elements, we're evaluating specific aspects that are tailored to um, each strategy and the toolkits that we've developed for our investment officers. And, and we take the, you know, the tool development process very seriously. And then in addition to all that, um, we also have a thematic overlay to our work as well. So as an example, we have specialists internally who focus just on climate or just on diversity or just on stewardship for our active equity managers as part of our uh, integration work. So this thematic overlay is, is critical as we seek to allocate our own internal resources to the areas where, you know, we feel that we can have the, the most impact over time, um, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, it, it's great. One clarifying question, because it's on, yeah. on my mind, the thematic, how, what's the feedback loop to investment managers who are not on track, you know, whether it's climate or whether it's diversity, you know, is it, is it a nudge? Is it a red line? Is it a nudge with a red line? How are you sending your feedback? Um, what's the philosophy of, 
around so, that. So first of all, we are, you know, as a first instance, and this is, a, you know, oftentimes we hear in the marketplace from managers that um, they don't always get feedback from their, uh, from asset owners. Um, you know, we've been committed over the last year to really change that, um, you know, from our side um, so that we are providing that feedback. We are communicating uh, how our program works and what's important to us. Um, and so a, a key, you know, that those discussions often, you know, turn very quickly to, you know, covering some of the issues you just outlined, John. So, um, you know, we view it as a dialogue. We view it as um, something that evolves over time. And, and we do believe that we, we need to meet our managers where they are, right? We can't just say, you know, here's what we think best practice is. Every manager needs to, needs to reach that tomorrow. Uh, that's, that's not practical and, and ultimately it wouldn't be very thoughtful uh, either on, on either side. So, so we're committed to have it be a dialogue and it's, um, you know, we don't, um, you know, we don't look to set red lines necessarily. Our, our goal is to see um, gradual progress over time or just progress over time generally. So, so that's, that would be the answer I would give to that. So let me ask you then and just kind of turn it back. How is ESG integrated into LGM's flagship active strategies? Like how, how does it, you know, beyond the, some of the things you were outlining earlier? Sure. Um, so the, the number kind of the highest level and most important, which I think matches really well with uh, the comments you shared is it's, it's going to be industry or investment strategy specific. It has to match the, the broad objectives and the current, the, the way the integration works has to mirror the, the investment strategy. So in the U S um, one of our uh, most flagship strategies is our, our U S a high grade credit. That's what we're known for. Um, a lot of our uh, liability uh, business is built on these underlying building blocks of having a really thoughtful U.S. credit strategy. So for U.S. credit, um, the core of our process is based on one simple question. Um, we want to assess the obligator's probability of default. That's what's going to to that's what determines all the success of our investment strategy. So you built, you, we build our whole investment thesis on probability of default. And the question is, how does ESG fit into our investment process there? So we create a fundamental view of every, uh, of every company. Uh, inside of that fundamental view, there are business risks and there are financial risks. And ultimately, this fundamental view has a has a specific rating, which will roll into um, our investment universe and our portfolio allocations. Um, and for us, ESG fits alongside the other business risks. So remember, there's business risk and financial risk. So you have, you know, what industry analysis you are, what's your competitive positioning, but then you also have your ESG profile, and that ESG profile weighs into that that kind of business risk assessment. Um, for us, we've really formalized this process in terms of we have a proprietary, um, we call it an ESG active view, which is um, relying on third party data points that we've very carefully curated as being um, the best underlying data, the uh, data that's relevant on an industry specific basis. And, and we've created our own views on weightings and every every company that our uh, research associates are looking at has our own our own uh, assessment of this profile. What does it look like over time? Where are the, the where are these red lines of, of really really significant risk? And if you and that's basically a quantitative assessment. And uh, we have to publish that 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 piece of research in order to hold these companies. We now publish that. So um, every every holding we have. For at the company level, um, has this assessment. We think that's correct or not correct for the following reasons. We think it's it's, it's going to improve. This doesn't substantially uh, impact our overall perspective. What we're really really careful of on this fundamental approach is while it may have a quantitative assessment that ESG score. Um, we will never say exactly how much did that ESG score weigh into our overall assessment to increase or decrease the fundamental value, right? Because it's it is a mosaic of many different feel of many different inputs. 
Um, so uh, while it is always going to be part of the analysis, the, how influential it will be will vary company by company or industry by industry. Um, so, so I just that that's kind of the that, that's kind of the best example of a very granular uh, where does it fit, and it's really in our fundamental research process. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. Um, so maybe I can move the conversation onto, you know, a more topical uh, question. Um, you know, given the current environment, I'm curious from your perspective, John, how has how has ESG changed uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic? I'm sure like sure. us, you're, you're wrestling with that. Yeah, it's a, it's a question we, we get all the time. And um, I always give the same answer, which is that there's a classic confirmation bias, which is those of us that have been in the ESG space, look at this uh, pandemic and we see in massive acceleration of uh, um, inquiries related to ESG, we see new flows related to ESG, we see, um, we see the pandemic as an ESG issue. Um, and, and a perfect example of you know, human capital policies becoming highly relevant in understanding winners and losers in the restaurant business, for example. Now, the confirmation bias is that if you're very skeptical of is ESG actually help you understand investment risk, you look at the pandemic and you do the complete opposite, right? So I think it was and Ryan Ayer is often quoted, I think the CEO basically saying, all environmental policies are out the out the window now, all we're thinking about is survival. And you know, to me it's a little bit of a time. So so the, the flip side is that you know ESG is a luxury only in, in up markets. It's not actually helping you understand fundamental, fundamental. Uh, characteristics of a business. Um, and so I think there are some legitimate cases to be made that ESG is long term. I would not make the case, and then there are elements that it's also, you know, quick, right? So Amazon would be very, is, is an, an awesome, prominent example of the importance of human capital management policies and strategy and the pros and cons that happens in real time. Um, so um, it's definitely a little bit of both. And um, I am, uh, you know, the, the the softer side of me is I kind of reflect on um, what on on a global reaction to a force that is is really really big. Um, you know, the the parallels to climate change, I think, and how quickly people have to move, and how how reliant they are on scientific information, and and collective action, and government interplay with how consumers react. That's what I'm studying, and I think well, there will be awesome case studies for years to come on that relationship. Um, so, uh, long-winded answer of saying um, I think it's it's a mild benefit and mild positive in terms of uh, of of action related to ESG, but um, uh, unclear. Uh, what about yourself? What what do you think have been any of the impacts? Yeah. So. I mean, this is a question that we are continuing to wrestle with internally, as as you and, and many people are. Um, you know, all businesses and investors are really evaluating how the pandemic and the severe health and financial system shocks have, that have come with it will necessitate a, a rethink um, of how we all go about our work. Um, it's very easy to say, as in the ESG context, as many people are right now, that the pandemic shows us the importance of S issues. And while we wholeheartedly agree with that, um, you know, we're seeking to take a more, a more thoughtful, nuanced and, and focused approach ultimately to these questions. So um, we believe strongly that issues around inequality, deglobalization, human capital management, the, the responsible allocation of capital in these admittedly very difficult times um, and the continued urgency of of climate change and ensuring a sustainable recovery are, are more pressing than ever. Um, so within that context, the issues that we view as critical for us to focus on are those around um, the highly regressive and, and discriminatory nature of the pandemic itself and who is most susceptible and, and who suffers the most as a, as a result of all the lockdown measures and, and their aftermath. Um, issues like the dearth of benefits for things like paid sick leave in the U.S., issues like the increased government intervention and cross-border investment and deglobalization more broadly in the U.S. and Western Europe and Asia, 
um, and issues around recovery packages around the world that that should have strong sustainability principles um, underlying them and a, and a recognition that climate shocks can have highly damaging implications for for vulnerable populations and and for the financial system too um, so those are some of the issues along with others that we've been grappling with and you can obviously expect to hear more from us on on that in the coming months um, relating to these topics but that's kind of internally where you know the direction that you know at a high level that we're taking with it um, but given that it's a highly fluid situation you know um, can't jump too quickly in any one direction or another oftentimes so um, yeah as I said before we're trying to be thoughtful about our approach excellent well thanks that's very very thoughtful um, and, and definitely excited to see where you go Hank, maybe we'll open it up um, if there's any questions you have or the, the broader group. Right. John, Michael, thank you for that great conversation. Um, let me just try to see if I could pick up from the last point about ESG and sort of human capital and the impact uh, of COVID and, um, and what that might or might not be doing. So, you know, my intuition is, um, you know, due to COVID, sort of the, the trend that we've been on for the last you know, 30, 40 years of more automiz automization, uh, automation, excuse me, uh, AI and robotics is, continue, is gonna continue and maybe even accelerate. Um, particularly, you know, we were hearing a lot of uh, news stories about uh, the infection rate in uh, slaughterhouses, et cetera. Um, so to that extent, um, how does ESG, or does ESG at all overlay with sort of that trend towards automation, robotics, and AI? And if it does, what, what is that overlay? John, do you want to take a first crack at that one? Um, sure. So there are two, two ways that I think about that question. So one is uh, very uh, selfishly, automation, and AI and data will have a massive impact in the investment management industry, right? Our, our industry is very, very susceptible to um, data and data, there's only very few people are needed to construct really, really thoughtful strategies. So I think the investment management industry is about to be in a really interesting place um, from an automation and data perspective. So that's kind of the, the selfish piece. In terms of ESG and data and automation, um, we are on a one-way street that there's going to be more data about everything, right? There, there's, there's, it's only in 10-year time, or you know, those you see those um, curves that you know every year the, all the data in the world doubles or something like you know something just unfathomable. And in that scenario the theory is that we should be better investors right the companies that are treating workers in a better way we should know and they should have a competitive advantage and that should be all, all better understood because the data is available i don't know if that's going to be the way that the market shakes out right so um I, I just I do so I think I do see this area where you you have more data and more data should make us better and should make us understand worker implications better. But then I guess very practically to your question of like, um, does automation change workforces in dramatic ways that we have to be aware of and prepared for? Absolutely. Um, you know, one small example is we're part of a, a, an investor coalition called the Human Capital Management Coalition that's calling on corporations to disclose better employment data. Employment data is really, really difficult to get your hands on. And we're talking pretty basic stuff, like how many full-time workers versus part-time workers versus gig workers do you have? And or, or even diversity, right? So, you know, obviously it's a major challenge Right now in the streets, people are protesting because there's been you know, systematic racism. And what we want to know is just simple things like how many black executives do you have? That number is not known. And so, um, you know, I think 
transparency is going to be the key. We don't have the ability to influence speeds of this or how it plays out, but we want to be aware of it. So it's all about, for us, it's all about data. So and I hope, hope that's a, a comprehensive answer. Michael, do you have any perspective? I mean, it, it's a it's a complicated question in many ways. I mean, clearly, um, you know, as as an investor, we allocate capital to um, managers that invest in in technology solutions and companies. And so, um, you know, there are so so from that perspective, that's clearly and the and the pandemic has has reflected this to a certain extent. Um, you know, those are those are good sectors to be investing in, and, and certain of these trends that that you and John outlined are inexorable in many ways, um, and have always and will continue to have you know impacts on uh, what labor forces look like and, and the nature and future of work. Um, at the same time, you know, I think it's 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 very clear in in our current environment where you know millions of people around them, tens, hundreds of millions of people around the world have been forced to work from home and um, the pandemic has accelerated some of these trends that were already well underway. Um, I think it's a little early to tell um, what the ultimate outcome will be, although there's plenty of, of commentary and, and scholarship on these particular questions. Um, you know, technology has, has moved the world forward and you know, along a, a certain path over time and, and will continue to. And, um, you know, it's just how much acceleration does the pandemic provide and, and where do we need to, you know, be thinking about, um, you know, how we, what actions need to be taken in that context. Governments around the world are, are grappling with that question and uh, are coming up with, with different answers uh, in a very fast moving environment. So, um, you know, there's a lot to think about. I just don't think ultimately there are, that many you know fully fleshed out answers that are a hundred percent right because because it's obviously very fluid so that's that's the perspective i would offer on that hank great thank you the next question is what have you observed to be the biggest hurdle for pension funds adopting sustainable investment practices uh, john maybe from sort of a macro standpoint and then uh, michael from sort of a, a micro new york common standpoint sure Sure. Um, I believe that the the biggest headwind or challenge is this nagging perception that if you consider ESG, you sacrifice risk and return profile. That perception is pernicious in in investment committees, uh, whether it's stated or not. That is the hurdle. Um, and you know, if I were to kind of in general for all of these and part of the reason why we set up that research up front about who is doing ESG and who isn't and I really focus in on policy is I think many U.S. public pensions need to have that policy discussion in an investment committee setting do we have a point of view on this or not is this create is this a better investment risk return or is this not? Are we doing this for some political reasons or not? And hash out that conversation because if it's not forced to be brought to the surface, then there's inaction uh, is essentially my view. So uh, that's, the, that's the number one thing. And I think there's reams of information of how of studies that say careful integration will not detract from performance. But there's also reams of studies that say that you can take any time period and say that you know this particular investment strategy didn't work for a whole variety of reasons so you know it's it's never going to be one with this study is better than that study on the on the investment side so it's just a question basically of investment belief when you open up the aperture to have more information is it possible to have better decision making and to me that philosophical question is a super easy one to answer um so that, that that's my view and you know to to offer the the micro answer i guess um you know and your question was about the adoption of of sustainable investing practices so in my mind the biggest hurdle um is is resourcing internal resourcing frankly and i think it's just as relevant for for asset managers as it is for pension funds um, it takes a fair amount of work um to to do that to do that well to foster that adoption so the more 
pension funds can gradually build up their capacity in this area. Um, the more bandwidth they can add, uh, the better results um, will will likely be over time. So I know that's in this environment that's a very uh, tough thing to say, but something that um, you know near common is certainly um, you know building out the team the way we have over time you know buys into that. Um, and so um, to do all the all the things that that John was describing, you know you, you do need dedicated internal resources uh, to a certain extent to help move that to help move the needle over time. So, and I'll jump on that. My, I couldn't agree more that that it's a very legitimate internal constraint, right? We have a team of 15 that do investment stewardship and think about ESG data. We know we're one of the biggest in the industry to do that, but even us, we don't feel like we have that, that level of expertise we would love to have on each individual topic to make more specific recommendations. And there's this interesting trade-off of like how much extra information is it going to give you? And are you going too far? Like, you know, you know, are, are we putting too many resources in something that don't doesn't really drive our alpha generation? And like getting that balance right is a real no one, it's a hard thing to do, right? Like, you know, so I, I think you're it's a, it's a really good area to, to to zero in on. Great. Last question, because we're running uh, close to the top of the hour. Um, uh, John, you re referenced the DOL uh, uh, proposed regs on ESG. Um, do you have any further reactions, both of you, to the uh, proposal? Sure, I can weigh in real quick. Um, so for, for everyone who's not fully familiar or didn't see the news, um, the DOL proposed expanding some of its um, interpretation of ESG and limitations of integrating ESG, or explicitly using ESG you know, funds or adding ESG funds as a default in your lineup and, and what are the requirements. And essentially, I think putting the onus on the investment trustee or whoever it is to make the investment committee to make the, to make the justification that the ESG characteristics are, are really driving financial performance. Um, I think that this is going to be a really, um, really public um, exchange. So there's, there's a public comment period over the next 30 days. Uh, I think a lot of asset managers are going to step up and say um, that ESG is absolutely important for understanding investment risk. Um, and and I think that the DOL is is viewing it very much from that legacy ethics perspective. Um, but we will see. So um, I think just stay tuned and expect a lot of both asset owners and asset managers will will likely comment. Um, and and question the underlying premise that you know really ESG is in in an old legacy way to advocate for environmental change, but it has nothing to do with financial performance. Whereas I think that's a you know let's say some people use the term Generation One way of thinking about this. Right, Mike, did you have any thoughts? I mean, it, not really. I mean, of course we saw it. We're taking a look at it. Um, obviously, it's um, since we're a DB plan, it does not technically apply to us, but um, you know, it's all very, all very recent, so we're we're taking a look. Right, John Hepner, Michael Eisenberg, thank you so much for your great presentation today and sharing with us your expertise. Thank you, everyone. Uh, please join us next Tuesday for our next webinar entitled "Blowing Up Your Board Is Not the Answer: Why Representative Boards Are in Your Members' Best Interest." Have a good weekend, everyone. Take care. Thanks, guys. Thanks.